been asked to talk about efficiency. It's been like asked to talk about world peace. You know, everybody wants it, but just not maybe tomorrow because there's too much money to be made uh, in, in the meantime. Okay, so I want to just have a quick look. Uh, Ian teed it up nicely with the, with the sort of the with the way the whole industry here has developed. Uh, I want to try as best we can to avoid sort of NIROI comparisons because it's not it's not where we want to go with this uh, discussion. But we really want to focus on a couple of things that Ian mentioned earlier on uh, this morning. Uh, just that question about the feed and interaction between feed and milk. Uh, calving month is in there somewhere as well. The big question on herd fertility and genetics, well flagged, I think, in the, in the in earlier speech, but we have to really get down to the nuts and bolts of what that means. A single slide on labour efficiency, which is an important one, uh, and maybe a word on milk solids as well. I think Lawrence is going to cover that in more detail than me. So, look, you're well used to looking at this stuff. Um, this is just your... This is just the new reality when it comes to milk price. Okay, you can see whether it's, you know, we always get beaten over the head for using the GDT as a, as a measure of anything. That's your, your, your New Zealand index. Or if you look at your EU average milk price, it's pretty much doing the same thing, right? We're going to be, it's up and down, up and down. As a, one man uh, described it, it's like a heart attack on a slide. And that's what it feels like when we're in the middle of it, okay? Now, just to be sure, like if we look here in terms of maybe where, where Ian teed it up, a lot of the sort of the direction, and there's a lot of talk this morning already about the direction in which we want to travel here, right? The direction that we have sort of taken maybe as an industry in Northern Ireland, I would contend, has pretty much been laid out here, right? The, our decisions around what we wanted to do maybe 10 years ago, and we're now on that road, a lot of those decisions were made when milk price was doing something like that, right? But now that's changed. So where do we go now, okay? What has happened in that time in Northern Ireland, taking the 15, 16 average, quite close to maybe your numbers, Ian, we're talking about 530 kilos of milk solids per cow. We're feeding them at 2.3, 2.4 tonne of concentrate to get that. Concentrate per litre of milk produced is about uh, 0.33. And I, it always struck me sometimes to talk to, to guys in Northern Ireland and say, you know, one third of the milk check goes to the mealman. And I said, could, could be right. But seemingly with those type of figures, it wouldn't be far from the truth on a milk price year like last year. Okay, so that's what has happened. That is where we're sitting. We're not a 9,000 litre system. We're not a 9,000 litre industry. We're a 7,000 litre industry with moderate to low solids. And the interesting thing about this is, okay, herd size has increased. Milk yield per cow has increased. But solids as, a, as percentages have remained pretty much static in the industry since about 2002, 2003. Our proteins are the same. Our fats are the same uh, as they were all those years ago. So I'd ask the question, what gains in efficiency have we really got? We've got better at feeding more meat cows. And we're, 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 we're getting better at managing larger herds of cows. What we haven't really changed is the stuff that we're actually, we're selling more solids per cow, there's no doubt about that. But in terms of changing the efficiency, I know Lawrence will come back to it, we look at, you know, we're pretty much static. We're, we're becalmed there at that level. And interestingly, of all the things we would see for our guys, one of the simplest and easiest and most profitable things to change on the farm is the solids content in the middle. Right? So it's an open goal for Northern Ireland dairy farmers to change that. Okay? Now, we'll come to some of the reasons as to why that may be uh, in a moment. So if you look, where has the concentrate versus milk yield gone in the meantime? That's the trend, right? and that's what we're just talking about. We can see definitely once quotas were, uh, once quotas were freed up and you were able to bring, uh, bring additional milk across from GB, uh, we did see this trend. And a lot of people say to me, well, sure, that's okay. We made more money while we were doing that. And herds got bigger, and each farm makes more money. That's fair enough. But um, what we're looking at, that's really in a situation maybe where milk price is a little bit more guaranteed than where it is now, right? Now, I do a lot of stuff with winter milk suppliers in, uh, in the south. And we do have our own steering groups and our committees that we meet to discuss the issues that are important to these farms. And if we go back maybe 10 years ago, when we talked to a lot of these farms, think of farmers actually, so very substantial all year round type milk suppliers. Uh, similar enough maybe to where the average is of the industry is here now. Those are the type of things that were coming up all the time. When we sat down and we talked to our farmers in that type of system, these were all the things that was annoying people. You know, how much should I be buffer feeding? What should the protein in that be? What's the response to concentrate going to look like? What's the crude protein? Should it be growing maize? Should it be growing whole crop? Should I be using three times a day milk in? You know, what about out of power feeders? All of them type of things, right? All the sort of stuff that drives the concentrate rate per litre of milk produced up. Not down, but up, 
right? So we've sort of said, okay, we want to engage with farmers and say, what's the, what are the questions here? But we sort of get the idea after talking to a lot of our farmers over a few years that they really are looking for answers to very technical questions, but maybe they're looking for the right answer to the wrong question. Okay, they're looking for the right answer to me. They're looking at the right. They're looking for the right answer to the wrong question. The questions and the issues that they really should be looking at are more uh, on this slide, I would say. And in time and over time, as you know, and as quotas have freed up for ourselves, more and more people are starting to look at these type of issues rather than just um, and even on winter milk farms. Okay, so fertility, 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 calving interval, quality of forage, EBI, your breeding index. Do we should we recycle cows or not? What's the best calving pattern? You know, our annual feed budget, as was mentioned earlier, soil fertility, like John's just after talking about, and maybe more detail on the rations that we're feeding rather than just the tons of ration that we're feeding. Milk yield per cow doesn't really come into it anymore, right? Milk yield per cow is a result, not a target, okay? And there's a reason for that, and this is from uh, benchmark figures from, the, from herds in the Lakelands region, about 300 herds, Calvin, Monaghan, um, I suppose Longford, the sort of north, you know, the northern part of the country. So we're not talking about uh, the subtropical south of Cork or where milk, you know, where everything is really nice and the sun shines all the time and we can leave cows out all the time and everything's fine and dandy, Jack. Right? So there is there is a word called currents, <laughs> right? So, but we what we have to remember is that that doesn't matter, right? Because if we took that and we put a different logo down there and we did the same data, data analysis for farms in Cork or Kerry or wherever, we'll get the same result, right? Effectively, milk from forage or forage utilised, whatever way you want to look at it on a per cow or per hectare basis, milk from forage. This every dot here is a farm and you're looking at the amount of grass uh, utilised on the farm as grass plus silage versus net, net margin per hectare. And Ian, you mentioned that about 60% of variation in profit explained by that. On the other hand, milk yield doesn't explain anything, right? Now we're not saying, I think sometimes we're misrepresented mis uh, on this, to say that we are in favour of low yield systems. We're not in favour of low yield systems, we're in favour of high output per hectare systems driven by the grass that you can grow yourself. Okay. Now, a lot of people don't want to hear this. A lot of people do not want to hear this. Even the farmers on this slide don't want to hear this. <laughs> that, is, that is an unfortunate reality. And I have, you know, I'd like to do some sort of a, a study in, in social science. It might maybe suit me, uh, my appearance, James, to do something <laughs> like that, to wonder why is that. Right. But the problem here is that milk yield per cow per se does not guarantee profit. Okay? And we have high and low and making profit and high and low losing money. But the difference is really wrapped up in how we achieve the yields that we do. Now, everyone loves talking about systems and systems of milk production to achieve uh, whatever it is we want to achieve. Now, look at Curtin's there is the farm in Cork, Bally Hayes is the farm over in Cavan, about 40 miles from here, uh, and Johnstown is our winter milk herd down in Wexford. Okay. Whether we are 100% spring calving, doing about 450 kilos of milk solids, or 60% autumn calving, doing 525, 530 kilos of milk solids, it doesn't really matter in terms of how we manage our forage. And I, we don't have time to go into the details, but effectively what we really mean here is there are tools and technologies out there, rotation plan in the spring, getting the farm grazed off and, and fertilizer out early enough in the spring to, get, to set the farm up for the rest of the year. Pretty much identical between the two systems. In mid-season, the quality of grass needed for a spring calve or an autumn calve are pretty much identical. Obviously, we would make better quality silage than they would for, for curtains or valley hays for, for spring calves and dry calves. And there will be some adjustments to the autumn budget for our grass, pretty much the only difference being we don't build as much grass in the autumn as the spring calves would. But the essential point here is the technologies and the, the practices are consistent whether we're trying to do sort of 7,000 litres on autumn calving or doing 5,500 litres on spring calves which is a good news message for the farmer because it means that what we have now is a consistency of message. And I think we have to start moving away from this notion of saying that, well, it's different for me. You know, just because I have 30% of the cows calving in the autumn, suddenly it's different for me. It's really not that different for you. Now, stocking rate comes into it as well. We come to that maybe in a while. Not going to go into the details here, but all I'm just going to point out a couple of quick things. We are not focusing on the crude protein levels anymore in our rations. We're, bit, we're really looking at the, uh, balancing our energy and our protein fractions. Like, it is not as if we just put cows in the shed and milk them for the crack in the, in the winter time. When we do it, we want to do it based on high quality forage and you know, a reasonable level of concentrate that's based on meeting the energy requirements and balancing the protein up to that, rather than starting with the protein and working back. 
and we have made significant savings per ton and probably our nitrogen efficiency is improved by, by doing that as well. And there's good science around that and there, there are a lot of work done in other institutes to, to say that, uh, that that can happen as well. It's not, we, don't, we haven't dropped protein below where we're actually clipping yield at all. It's just to maybe make better use of the protein that we have. And very simple system, no need for straw. If you've got the high for quality forage in place, you don't need uh, much in terms of additional uh, forages, right? So look, just to give you an idea, we compared flat rate and feed yield system, for example, our concentrate, whether we went flat rate or feed yield, our concentrate per kilo of milk came out pretty much the same. The reason for that being that our focus is on the, really on the focus is on the, the milk from forage part of the, of, of the diet. So we're looking at about 530, 540 kilos of milk solids from about 1.2 to 1.3 tonne of concentrate in a winter type <coughs> system. We would see that as a sort of a benchmark of being quite efficient. Ah, what about this now? Sure, look, if milk price changes, you know, my farm's going to change. I'm going to make money. Like, I hear this a lot. I'm going to make money on the good years. Uh, you're going to make good money on the bad years. We hear this all the time. Sit around waiting for milk price to prove you right. That happens a lot. Okay, we know it. It happens in all our discussion groups. So again, to look at what is that? Is that real? Again, every <coughs> excuse me, every blue dot is a farm, and we just rank them based on the profitability. The, the, the profitability per hectare at 26 centiliter. The profitability per hectare at 35 centiliter. Okay, so. Trying to look at this, do, do farms really re-rank depending on milk price? And the answer to is this is really that these are the least profitable farms at low milk price, they're also the least profitable farms at high milk price. So when you're good, you're good, and when you're bad, you're bad. Okay, so do not sit around waiting for milk price to prove you right. You just get better at what you do, and you'll be right all the time. Okay? <laughs> and what's the difference on those farms? Stocking rate is higher, feed cost per litre is about two and a half to three cents a litre less. Whether it's higher low milk price, higher solids per cow, higher milk, or sorry, higher stocking rate systems, but less purchase feed to achieve the same milk yield with higher stocking rate. So it has to come from somewhere. It's coming from graze, grass, grass management, better quality forage. And interesting also, when you look at these farms, there is less depreciation and less machinery costs associated with the high forage systems, which we sometimes forget. When we go down a low forage route, the funny thing is, a lot of farms that are interested in, not interested in forage quality, are very interested in forage machinery, for some reason. <laughs> the best machine to harvest uh, grass is probably a cow, and that's, we, we just need to keep that in mind, okay? Very quickly, James, moving it on, cow type came up before, you know, we talk about, and Brendan Horne talks about this a lot in, in Moor Park, we need to have a CV for a cow. We don't just say we want uh, a cow that shows up tomorrow morning, first day at work, gives us 40, 50 litres, job done. What we want is somebody that will still be with us in five years' time. Okay? Hiring is the hardest part. Retention of staff, as we all know in any business, is the hard part. So we need to think of our cows like we would think of our staff, we want to retain them. So what do they need to do to be good <coughs> for us? They need, first thing to do, they need to calve probably on their own. They need to start cycling quickly after, they need to be cycling within 30 days without intervention. They need a high conception of the first service. They need to be able to produce milk from a high forage diet, which will give you a feed efficiency. They also need to be able to walk, avoid um, too much in terms of mastitis, and critically, for a low milk price year, they have to have the capacity to retain body condition score without us having to, to mine them uh, with, with lots and lots of additional expensive concentrate. So whether it's herd expansion, or whether it's margin or volatility we're talking about, all of these things make a difference. In fairness, all of those things are pretty much accounted for within our, the economic breeding index, which you've heard a bit about. So the economic breeding index, again, sometimes is misconstrued as a, an index for spring calving or an index for low yielding cows. Not the case. What is the index designed, designed to do? It's designed to produce more kilos of fat and protein, uh, reduce the processing charge on your milk, uh, cows that will do all the things we talked about, more fertile, easier to manage, uh, good on their feet, uh, good on their, in, in, good on their uh, cell count resistance and good, good long, you know, multiple lactations. And we have found that using this it, system for spring or autumn calving herds working very, very well indeed. Now, it doesn't have tight scores included, but we can come back to that in discussion if anyone wants to talk about it. We just don't have time to talk about it now. Now, Ian mentioned it again, this question of too many passengers, right? This is something that is very important, I think, for, in our situation with a lot of herds maybe that are trading on the idea of yield. 
Here's a cow. Just t this is just from our, our, our milk program <coughs> figures. Doing 7,800 <coughs> kilos on a 374 day calving it. That's on the record. If you look at that cow's actual yield from the years she's in the herd, she's doing 7,800 per year. So basically, she's doing what the recording says because fertility's under control, right? Here's a different cow doing 9,700 kilos. Okay, higher yield cow. Calving it in 449 days, okay? Because the long lactations and the maybe a little longer dry and people say, oh, well, should she milk on? She's a high yielder and all this kind of stuff. If you add that up based on annual yield, you're down at 6,800. So actually, the higher yielding cow is the lower yielding cow because of fertility. And we've seen a lot on our, uh, a lot on our liquid milk type herds or non-seasonal herds that don't call based on fertility as strongly as they should. We see a lot. Everyone thinks that they're doing 8,000 litres. They're doing six and a half, in reality. When you add up the number of cows you feed for the amount of milk you get. Does genetics have an effect on that? Yes, it does. Stephen Butcher did some great work on this, I think, looking at high fertility, low fertility lines. And you can see, this is just the number of cows cycling after six weeks. After 42 days, the cows bred to be a bit more fertile, 90% uh, of them almost cycling in within 42 days. The fert minus cows, 20% of them, Cycling after forty-two days, identical diets, identical management, <coughs> identical. Diet. So straight away after forty-two days, you're running more of these up the crush. You're looking. Am I going on a cedar program? Am I using? I'm going to use PG, GNRH, whatever it is. You're going to have to put a program in place to kickstart those cows cycling. These cows do it in their own. Straight away, we're in the same. If you've got an early first ovulation, they're going to go in calf a bit easier for the first service. So. You know, a lower percent with nutritis as well, which is very interesting. Better uterine health, fewer washouts. They have stronger heats. They show heats for longer. Fewer silent heats, fewer false heats. And also, critically, uh, Stephen measured this. Higher progesterone at the time of establishment for pregnancy and bigger uh, corporate UT, bigger CLs on, on the ovary, actually. So, you know, we, we talked about it a few years ago and said, you know, what is it that makes high fertility genetics cows more fertile? And the answer to that is everything. You know, it's not a case of 